Hi, I'm Pierre Fleury from uh, the IFT, and this is um, a pre-recorded talk for the online conference Cosmology from Home 2021. I'm going to talk about gravitational lensing, and the person who talks the best about it, in my opinion, is my friend Blondie, and as he puts it very nicely, you see in this world there's two kinds of lenses, my friend, those produces multiple images, and those that don't. You don't, obviously. So what Blondie is trying to say here is that uh, we traditionally distinguish between two different regimes of gravitational lensing, namely strong lensing on the one hand and weak lensing on the other hand. These two regimes differ by various aspects. Uh, for example, from the observational point of view, strong lensing is producing multiple images with very strong uh, distortions with respect to the in intrinsic shape of the source, while weak lensing is somehow preserving the integrity of, uh, of, the, of the sources by producing only a single image uh, that have only weak distortions with respect to in its intrinsic shape. From the modeling point of view, uh, strong lensing is typically due to a single isolated uh, dense matter lump like a galaxy or a cluster of galaxies that would be located between the observer and the source, while weak lensing is mostly due, well, typically due to uh, the accumulated effects of many matter lumps that would be all along the line of sight. From the cosmological point of view now, um, strong lensing and particularly uh, the time delays between multiple images of quasars, for example, is uh, used to measure the hubble lemaitre constant, H0, so the expansion rate of the universe today, while uh, weak lensing, and particularly via cosmic shear, is used to measure the mean density of our universe, omega m, or the fluctuations and the fluctuations of this density at the linear level encoded in the parameter sigma 8. Now, the third protagonist of, um, of my presentation here is the line of sight. So to, be, uh, to put things simply, line of sight effects are the weak lensing perturbations to strong lensing. This is known to be a, um, a, a key source of uncertainty in the modeling of strong lenses. And this is particularly critical for time delay cosmography measurements of H0. But it could also be used as a new opportunity for novel measurements of weak lensing. And this is what I'm going to uh, argue in the rest of this presentation. Let me start with a bit of theory. So let's see how we can model theoretically uh, these line of sight effects in strong gravitational lensing. Let me start from the very beginning. So consider a point source that would be observed in the absence of any lensing in a direction beta. Now, uh, when we add a matter lump here uh, on the line of sight, so in the, in the theory of strong gravitational lensing, what we typically do is that we project the matter uh, or the matter density within a single plane that I'm calling here the plane number D, so uh, like dominant lens or deflector plane. And when light reaches that plane, it is suddenly deflected by an angle that I'm calling alpha hat, the deflection angle, which depends on the details of uh, the projected density of matter within that plane. Now, because of that deflection, the position of an image, theta, differs from the, the position of the source, beta, and the difference is called the displacement angle, alpha. For geometrical reasons, this displacement angle is not exactly equal to the deflection angle, but it is rather proportional to it with a factor that depends on the angle diameter distances between the observer, the lens, and the source. The result of that procedure is what we call the lens equation, which relates the position of the source, beta, and the position of the image, theta. So this is the equation that you want to solve if you want to determine uh, the, um, the different images theta associated with a given uh, source beta. Now, what happens when we add to that picture uh, other lens planes that I'm labeling with uh, a, a letter L here? So same thing, whenever light crosses one of those planes, it is deflected by a certain amount. Uh, 
And I'm calling here the partial displacement angle alpha i l j, the displacement that would would be produced for a source located in the plane number j, as observed from the plane number i, if the lens number l were alone. So this, is, uh, this will turn to be a very practical notation for uh, the rest of uh, this presentation. Now, what is to have, what it is to have a dominant lens? So what I call the dominant lens approximation will simply consist in assuming that all the lenses but the dominant one D here are producing a very, very small displacement angle individually. So in practice, I'm going to work at first order in those um, individual displacements due to all the lenses but the dominant one and work at arbitrary order for the dominant lens. So I'm sparing you the details here, but the result of such an approach is that the lens equation still, take, uh, still takes the same uh, form. So uh, with a deflection angle or displacement angle alpha, which is the sum of the contribution of all the lenses, the main one and the perturbers. Let me go through all these terms to make things a bit more, uh, a bit clearer. The first one, alpha ODS of theta here is simply uh, what we would have, so the, co the contribution of the main lens in the absence of all the uh, perturbers. The middle term here is the effect of the contribution of the foreground lenses, the lenses, the perturbers that are between the observer and the dominant lens. So they simply add up to the displacement here. This uh, right-hand side term here is uh, similar as the previous one, but it concerns now the background lenses, so the lenses located behind the main deflector. And the difference with the previous one is that now it needs to be evaluated at a different position, namely the argument of those terms here correspond to the fact that we are evaluating those deflections at um, well, along the unperturbed uh, ray. So the one that is here, the transparent um, red ray that would be affected only by the main lens. So this is a sort of Born approximation that would only account for the, um, the displacement of the main lens. And finally, uh, this term here that appears in the argument of the main lens is due to the fact that because we have foreground lenses, the light ray that is starting from the observer is going to reach a different position in the main lens plane compared to uh, in the absence of those foreground deflectors. So here, this term represents the post born corrections for the main lens plane, and it needs to be here for uh, mathematical consistency of the expansion. So that is the idea um, or the baseline theory on which uh, the rest of uh, this, uh, the result that I'm going to show afterwards are based. And so let me go straight to an application which concerns cosmic shear with Einstein rings. I must say here that uh, I'm borrowing the title from a, a paper by Simon Bieder and collaborators that was published in 2017. So I'm basically here building upon their original idea, but making it more accurate and more specific. The context is the following. We now know that um, if we are observing an Einstein ring like this one, the actual shape of the image is uh, due to a combination of the properties of the main lens and of the uh, perturbations that are along the line of sight on the top of the main lens. And so the question is, is it possible in practice to distinguish between the effect of the main lens and the effects of the perturbers? So to answer this question, I need to uh, simplify a bit further my uh, lens equation. This is because uh, with this expression of the displacement angle, I should in practice specify a model for each of my perturbers, which can be very tedious. So what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to work in the so-called tidal regime. This means that uh, I'm in practice, I'm assuming that the, um, the size of the Einstein ring, the size of the image that I am, that I am observing, 
is very small compared to the typical scale over which the partial displacement angles due to the perturbers is evolving. That means that I can, uh, with, across that relevant field, I can tailor expand these uh, partial displacements, which now become just the multiplication of their argument with a certain matrix, which represents the partial derivatives of that quantity. Physically speaking, this matrix that I'm calling the tidal matrix is composed of two main components. So the first one is what we call convergence. And this must be seen as the effect of a, a smooth matter component that would be encountered by the light beam that is producing some isotropic focusing of light. The second part, which is the trace free and um, trace free and symmetric part of, the, of that matrix would be caused by the presence of some matter lump very far from the line of sight. And that is producing a shear of, uh, of the light beam. So in, of, of course, in general, a tidal plane would be the combination of those uh, two effects of convergence and shear. The advantage of that approach is that it drastically simplifies uh, the lens equation or the displacement angle. Now all the effects of uh, the, um, the line of sight perturbations are encoded in a handful of parameters, namely three matrices, this gamma ds, gamma od, and gamma os. Those matrices indicated by two indices ij represent just the sum of all the uh, single planes that would be located between the two indices. For example, gamma OS here is the um, traditional weak lensing effect. It is therefore, it represents the accumulated convergence and shear that are due to all the lens planes, but the main one, uh, all along the line of sight. Gamma OD here is a bit similar, but now it concerns only the foreground lenses. Uh, and it represents the accumulated shear and convergence as if we were observing something within the main lens plane. And similarly, gamma ds represents the accumulated convergence and shear as if the observer were located in the dominant lens plane. All right, so now we are ready to answer this uh, question that I asked at the beginning. Is it possible to distinguish between the properties of the main lens and the properties of the line of sight perturbations? So for that purpose, I have rewritten the uh, entire lens equation. And this is to emphasize that the position of a source, beta, is unknown. It is also a free parameter of the model. So that means that I can actually multiply this whole equation, where I can apply any transformation to that lens equation, it would still be a valid model. So in practice, what I'm doing here is that I'm going to multiply this lens equation with this matrix, which leads me to the uh, minimal lens model. So this uh, lens equation is the minimal lens model because it features the uh, smallest number of free parameters and therefore fully encodes all the degeneracies that may exist between those parameters. This term here plays the role of the main lens in a lens model. Psi mod here is the combination of two things the Fermat potential psi ODS of the main lens. And in its argument, it is modified by the contribution of the foreground lenses. And this encodes what I call the internal degeneracy because, because of this um, intrication of the main lens properties and the foreground lenses, we have little hope of ever being able to distinguish in practice between the properties of the main lens and the properties of the foreground perturbers. The other parameter that I called gamma line of sight here is a particular combination of the uh, three um, line of sight tidal matrices according to that expression here. And this in turn encodes what I would call the external degeneracy. External degeneracy in the sense that because of those two, those three parameters appear together in a sum, there is no way that we could ever distinguish between their individual effects. They are all acting together with that particular combination. So let me be uh, a bit more um, 
specific with a given example. So here I'm showing the images that would be produced from a source that is here uh, modeled as a Gaussian source to make, uh, to, to give just an example. The middle image here is produced by an elliptical lens in the absence of any line of sight perturbation. The right hand side image, however, is produced by a spherical lens, so with no ellipticity, but in the presence of foreground perturbations that are producing a shear. And you can see that it's impossible to distinguish by eye between those two images. And this is because they actually differ by just a small amount. In terms of surface brightness, these two images differ by only about 3% maximum. So it is very unlikely that we could ever distinguish in practice between the effect of the ellipticity of a lens and a foreground shear. So this is the first message. However, can we distinguish between the effects of the main lens and this other parameter, the gamma line of sight effect? So I'm replacing here the image uh, of the right by the image that would be produced of the same source, but by a spherical lens and uh, a, uh, an entire line of sight perturbation that is such that this term is non-zero, but gamma uh, OD, so foreground terms would be zero here. And now you can already see that by eye, we can distinguish between those two images. In terms of surface brightness, they now differ by about 20%, which is definitely something measurable. So in summary, although it should be impossible to distinguish between the ellipticity of the main lens and the foreground perturbations, it is possible to distinguish between the ellipticity of the main lens and this line of sight shear. In other words, this particular quantity is measurable independently of the properties of the main lens. And this is very interesting because this tells us that we have a way to measure the shear in some very specific directions. Think of uh, what, how we do cosmic shear in general. So the traditional way of doing cosmic shear is to extract the signal, a signal of shear, by doing lots of statistics, by looking at how the, in the intrinsic, uh, sorry, by the, how the um, observed uh, ellipticity of galaxies is correlated. And this is a, a statistical method that is known to be complicated and that requires uh, to, uh, to treat a certain number of uncertainties, the shape noise, for example, the systematic uncertainty of the intrinsic alignments. Now, what happens if in that field we have on the top of the galaxies an Einstein ring? From this Einstein ring, we could measure the line of sight shear very accurately and independently from all the rest. And this, should, this can give us a very accurate measurement of the shear in that specific direction, completely independently of intrinsic alignment, shape, noise, and etc. This could be therefore used to anchor the measurements of cosmic shear. So my message here is that there exist in principle synergies between strong lensing and weak lensing, and those must be exploited in the forthcoming uh, surveys. And I'm thinking in particular of uh, the Euclid survey here. And this brings me to my conclusion. So line of sight effects are external perturbations to strong lensing. It is what we could call the weak lensing of strong lensing. In that context, uh, our technical increment has been to propose a general formalism to model those line of sight effects in the presence of a dominant lens. Our first main result has been to identify a measurable notion of line of sight shear, which should greatly improve uh, the measurements of cosmic shear if they are combined with them. And the second result that I didn't discuss here, but that I'm happy to talk about during the live session, is that we identified another probe, the distortions of strong lens in critical curves, that have the ability to break the mass sheet degeneracy. Thank you very much for your attention.